The purpose of this video is to talk about the second half of our characteristics of living things. We talked about the first four in the video last night, so tonight we'll get into the last four. Uh, these are probably a little bit more technical, and I'll make sure that you understand the differences between some of the characteristics of living things that end up being a little bit similar. The first one for us to talk about is that all living things respond to stimuli from their environment. So some of these examples are really easy to see. For example, if we have a cheetah chasing a gazelle, as you would see in this picture, uh, it's obvious to see how that gazelle is responding to its environment. Right? It's running away from the cheetah. It's very clearly responding to some type of stimuli, to some type of predation. Now the thing you've got to remember is these aren't just characteristics of some living things. Everything we're talking about on this list must apply to all living things on the planet. So it's easy to see this one with animals, but what about something a little bit more simplistic? Uh, if we look at plants, if we take this orchid for, ex for an example, you'll see that it's arced towards the window. So it's growing towards the light. This is something that all plants do. It's a process called phototrophism, where plants are going to grow towards the light that's around them. So all living things respond to some kind of stimuli, whether it's a complex animal, a plant, even small single-celled organisms. Uh, we'll look at some things underneath the microscope that move toward and away from light. They also have things on the outside of their cells called chemoreceptors that allow them to move towards or away from different chemicals they sense in the water. So there's definitely some type of response to stimuli going on with every living thing. It might not always be as complicated as we're used to thinking about it with animals, but there is some type of response with any living thing that you have on the planet. The next one is all living things require materials and energy. So we've got this guy here chomping down on like a giant turkey leg. It's easy to think about living things eating. And uh, this answer, this requirement of materials and energy, this one usually chews up a lot of the answers in class when we do that warm-up on the first day, and we're trying to talk about the characteristics of living things and kind of brainstorm these things. So people will often tell me, you know, they require food, uh, they require oxygen, living things require shelter. All of that falls under materials and energy. You know, the idea of requiring oxygen, any of those base necessities for life fall under this category. So keep in mind that there's a lot going on here, uh, but we would include all of those things under this criteria. The next one is maintaining homeostasis. Uh, this is one that you probably haven't heard of before. So in our example here, we've got this guy profusely sweating, right? And uh, the idea behind sweating is that it's actually a mechanism to cool your body off. Uh, now, it's hard to understand in Pennsylvania because it is so ridiculously humid here, but a good example of how sweating is supposed to work is uh, if you're at the pool and it's a windy day, and you're pretty comfortable while you're in the pool, but when you get out of the pool and like the wind's blowing, it actually makes you feel really cold. Uh, the reason that happens is when the wind is blowing, that causes the water on your body to evaporate, and as that water evaporates, it takes a little bit of heat with it. So technically, if you're sweating and you're in a condition where evaporation is going to take place, so it's not quite as humid as it sometimes is when it's really hot in Pennsylvania, uh, then you'll get that evaporation taking place and it'll cool you off. So that's why it's nice like, if you're sweating to you stand in front of a fan or something like that. That speeds up that process of evaporation and it makes you feel a little bit cooler. Um, definitely the idea of body temperature regulation is one of those things for homeostasis. I'll stop this one because I'm sure that's a little distracting. Uh, but the, the main thing with homeostasis is that it's maintaining some type of balance. So this could be a lot of different things. You know, it could be body temperature, like we said. It could also be hydration. Uh, that's a big one. I guess that also kind of goes into that little animated GIF that we were just looking at. Your body needs to maintain a balance of water. Uh, think about what happens if you don't have enough. Right, if you're not consuming enough water, you get thirsty. You know, you, your muscles might start to cramp. You get these signals from your body that you need more hydration. If you overhydrate, then your body's still trying to maintain balance. So you end up purging a lot of that water. You're spending a lot of time going to the bathroom if you're overhydrated. Uh, so your body's always trying to maintain balance. So this whole idea of homeostasis is to outline that idea. The whole concept there is this idea of balance. 
Uh, this is one that probably causes the, the most confusion, and we'll spend some time on this later on in the year, uh, but it's adaptations evolve over time. And so what we're talking about are small adaptations within the population that eventually add up to evolutionary characteristics. People oftentimes jump to the stereotypical bumper sticker of human evolution. And there's many reasons why I dislike this image, but one of the things that we'll talk about first is the idea that we've got modern people, and this makes it look like we're one, two, three, maybe three and a half evolutionary steps away from primates and things that you would see in the zoo. Uh, what you'll see when we get to evolution is there's actually many, many dozens of individuals between modern people and then our closest true, like, primate ancestor. Um, and granted, we are also primates, but I mean primates in the sense of, um, like, higher apes. They are things that aren't quite as closely related to us as you might think from looking at this bumper sticker style picture of evolution. So we'll scrap that one for now. When we get to this chapter, um, I'll actually tell you that, that, I, that I hate this picture, and I think this picture leads to uh, more misconceptions about human evolution than anything. But what you'll see when we get there is that that picture should include many more individuals. So in this particular instance, we have modern people up here at the front. Homo sapiens are us, and then we have the Neanderthals just behind us. And then there are other groups that are more closely related to modern people. I've got Homo erectus, Homo habilis, going back to these groups that have an A in front of their name instead of an H. So our scientific name, right, is Homo sapiens. So other groups that have the same first part of their scientific name are closely related to us. For example, you know, Homo erectus is one of our closer ancestors. Their name comes from them standing erect, standing upright. Uh, back here, they start with a different scientific name. This one, uh, the A is short for Australopithecus. So Australopithecus robustus and Africanus, those are our close ancestors. So we are closely related to individuals that are far more similar to modern humans than a diagram like our first one would have you believe. You know, it makes it look like we're just a few steps away from some of the higher apes. And that's, that's really not the case. Right, and then this one, of course, is a monkey, right? It's got the, the tail, whereas the apes are uh, having the absence of the tail. But this picture, you know, again, makes it look like we're four steps away from the apes, and it, it's definitely not the case. So we'll talk about this more when we get to evolution at the end of the year, but this is very much of an oversimplification of the concept, and it's something that I just think leads to some problems with understanding, because many of you have probably seen a picture like that before. You know, I jokingly call it bumper sticker evolution, but that's often where you see those things. And uh, the concept itself is good, it's just uh, instead of looking like maybe the, the line at the grocery store, it should look more like the line for Steel Force at Dorney Park between modern people and then certainly monkeys or any ape uh, in that evolutionary line. The last thing to mention is the fact that there are eight characteristics of living things. And, and one of the things I want to stress with you here at the end is that you need to have all eight of those characteristics in order for something to be alive. So we'll go through some examples in class of things that have some of the characteristics but not quite all of them. So they'd be close to being considered alive or living on their own, but they're not truly a living thing. Uh, some things, for example, like fire, have a few of the different criteria. So for example, like fire will consume materials and energy, right? Fire consumes things uh, as it burns, but it's not made of cells, it's not made of DNA. So it doesn't have some of those other criteria that we're talking about here. But you need to be careful that something that you're talking about has all eight of those characteristics in order to truly be considered living. So uh, as always, I appreciate you guys taking the time to watch the videos. Just make sure you answer the questions, and we'll talk about this one more in class tomorrow. Have a good night.